Roshini and welcome to our series Tricks of the Trade. We are so excited and happy that you are here uh, giving your precious time to us and like talking about your skills, about you as an expert, talking about what's going on in the industry, right? So telling about the mission and why as a curate, as a team curate, we started this series Tricks of the Trade. So as you know, a lot of freshers are in the market or people who are in the industry but don't have that kind of knowledge, right? That's why I come experts like you helping those people, helping the community building differently, right? Talking about Curate, so Curate is an annual mini venture and what we do, we create the best every teams for various startups. So talking about that, Varshini, let's start digging into your, how did you start and give us the brief that how did you start into B2B marketplace and how into the sales, right? So uh, Mike is now on the team. Thank you so much, Amrita. Pleasure to be here as well. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as a very quick introduction, I kind of happened to get into sales. I was an engineer before I moved into sales for a couple of years, and then I realized um, I don't want to be in a very demanding customer facing role. And I was primarily looking for an interjection between technical and customer facing where I thought pre-sales would be a good avenue. But as and when I stumbled upon Paperflight, they did have an opening for an end-to-end -end sales role. And I said, that's going to be a really good experience. So let's get on board and try it out. So in short, it was by chance, Amrita. <laughs> but uh, like, as you said that you are being in an engineer tech background now, uh, shifting to the challenging mode of uh, face-to-face role, right? So how was your experience? Did you, uh, like, what were your personal experience? Did you feel any changes? Uh, there, obviously, there were a lot of changes. So I used to be in a 70,000 member large enterprise and I moved into a 20 member startup. So there were a lot of changes, but that's exactly what I was looking for as well. Right? Uh, there were changes in processes. There were changes in the kind of ownership that you have on various activities and also with the uh, extent to which you did have to take ownership of various um let's say, activities and day-to-day -day responsibilities that was assigned to you, Brizzy, right? So I started off as an account executive where um, we did try converting all of the inbound requests that were a part of the marketing funnel that were coming in, right? So that's essentially my first role into sales as such. Uh, so I think I was a really blessed and fortunate person to have directly started off with an experience such as that uh, but the journey so far has been phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, to brush me i see journey as you said that how you shifted and it's maybe it's like phenomenal so talking about that uh, the most important part for any sales process to start is to get the best leads to get the relevant leads, okay. So where the processes are done, like cold calling and cold email. So how do you structure a cold call and how do you structure a cold email, right? And mm -hmm. what uh, are the examples they use to do that? That's a great question. Uh, so primarily your intent is to make sure that um, there's going to be some benefit for the end user that you are picking up the phone and calling or writing an email to, right? Uh, you either understand what their pedigree is, you probably figure out people who have moved to a recent job, and that's a, an account that you were already looking to prospect. So primarily, I would start off by saying that you generally start off with an account book and a possible list of people that you would reach out to. And after that, it's going to be a very uh, processed, let's say, conversation that you would have done like previously in your head uh, to make sure that you understand how exactly you can strike the chord, right? Email is going to be a slightly different note because you're not very sure about what kind of responses that you will get. But on the phone, they're going to be like direct objections. So that's a couple of things that you might want to get used to practice before you jump on and talk to somebody from a decision making standpoint um, about certain things as um, something as simple as pitching your entire product. Right. But again, as 
everybody out there in the industry saying ditch the pitch do not go after jumping into what the product does but actually concentrate more on how it would be of highest relevance to them and why they should spare the next five or six minutes to give you that time to understand what's going to happen and also schedule that follow-on conversation right so i think that is primarily something that's worked very well for me and the team in addition to which, uh, we also need to make sure that the messaging that you are trying to convey is different from the horde mass emails that you're getting, right? Because if you are doing that, we're definitely going to be targeting high persona and they receive at least like 200 um, similar emails every day. So your subject line optimization of the body within uh, the mm -hmm. subject, which is probably going to be the first seven or eight words that would be visible is of the highest prominence, right? So depending on the industry that you're reaching out to the market um, and the kind of people in the decision making ladder, all of this needs to be uh, tweaked and personalized to make sure that it catches their attention at this point in time. True, Ashley, as you say, uh, personalization plays a very important role. We cannot, like, uh, while uh, scrolling to our emails also, personally, we do, when we see some personalized, we just tend to open it more rather than one salesy pitch, one salesy email, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's a human nature and human behavior. So okay. uh, talking about uh, the leads, as we said, getting the leads from cold and every other sources. So mm -hmm. sometimes what uh, happens, the lead we are talking to the prospects become inactive. So has that happened to you also? And what are the common reasons you do you think leads become inactive after some conversation or after some time, right? So mm -hmm. what do uh, you think about this? So ghosting is, I think, the most common thing that happens to any salesperson. So if there's one thing that you would want a salesperson to pick in common between one and the other is as simple as that. Um, and given the economic conditions outside the downtown and the unpredictability, it's more likely to happen now than before. So a couple of things uh, me and the team are working on primarily to ensure this does not happen is to make sure that your discovery in the conversation is extremely solid right you make sure you understand their value and you hear it from them to assure you that you know hey these things are of priority and this is what will help me take this deal forward right so you identify your champions your multi-thread you make sure that you've got enough people within the organization supporting you and your platform in that entire bit mm -hmm. because nobody evaluates one tool and goes forward with the vendor, right? That would be a better form of ghosting as opposed to when you had multiple players in the game initially and then somebody had gone ahead and ghosted you, right? So it's going to be a little tricky as to how you would want to follow up with them. So I would circle back and solidify discovery to make sure I've got like two or three very good reasons that they should continue talking to me, right? Mm -hmm. And um, apart from that, it's very important that your follow-up emails are not one-liners and they do add value to every single time that they're trying to open it, right? So you continue to bring in all of the information that tells them about, you know, constant value add, which both imparts um, a good salesperson in the individual reaching out, as well as the values of the company, right? So it's both sides of the spectrum. So instead of just, you know, typing in something like, hey, I'm bouncing this up for your reference, checking in on how it's going on your end try to put in that extra effort for every single time that you reach out to that prospect if mm -hmm. not pick up the phone call at a good time be conscious about the time zone that they are in and the kind of uh people that they will be talking to as well right? because you've gotten a fairly good idea as to how busy they are so pick up the phone call them and try to bring it to closure at some point in time and of late i would definitely say videos have been working pretty mm -hmm. well um the different channels as well right you could try linkedin you could try imessage um, you could try various other modes of reaching out to them uh to make sure all of this is a little different uh so a couple of things that has at least 
prompted some form of response more than the others has been personalized gifs um or voicemails that you've left them right so they do get back to that if not you let one of their colleagues know that you know hey this is of burning importance um could you like reroute this entire conversation so these are a couple of things that people could try maybe <laughs> thank you for the like deep down details uh, like personalization in voice recording and gifs are like really really a unique way to uh, get it in done right so talking about that uh, you as maintain the end to end process right so you get a lot of leads uh, you have to maintain that yeah this is uh, the lead is in that stage it's first stage we are talking stage or it's in the conversation closer stage so how does lead identification status identification and tagging help in uh, lead management and prioritization oh well, that's a great question so primarily um for us at least right at paperfly the lead is prioritized over the others after the first demo has been taken so um for us the entire discovery and the demo conversation happens during the first call itself and depending on let's say the timelines right what would be the date of closing for you and definitely the ticket value as well and as well as who in the leadership convers uh, in, in the ladder that you're talking to are primary factors that decide in um the prioritization of leads per se right and more and above that as a tool paperfly also helps with uh the content side of it hmm. we do um understand how much of that has been engaged and who amongst the decision making group or the committee are being your champions internally right so with all of this information put together this is something that's assigned in the crm and we also do cater to the percentage of win right like what what would be the probability that this would close depending on multiple factors are various you know criteria that we choose to prioritize all of our leads so prioritization basically helps in how frequently you're following up uh, what are the information that you have to um become one of the top few vendors in the contention and also ensure that you've already gotten the executive sponsors buy in when the initial conversations are being happening right so all of these have become deciding factors to ensure that those are the specific leads or accounts that you really want to double down all of your efforts on mm-hmm. true true like talking about this lead uh, prioritization management according to all these uh, checklists is very important because we get a lot of people and handling them timely giving them their due importance is very necessary to so talking about that uh, what are the timelines do you uh, mm-hmm. see from getting the leads to getting it converted to getting the last stage right so what mm-hmm. timeline do you usually see in uh, products and what do you think that uh, how can we uh, like close it more uh, fast right so i know that different clients have different timeline according to the ticket size but what are the average have you seen in the industry yeah i think you kind of answered what, what exactly i was going to say because um as an account executive at paper flight i cater to all of the markets as well right so this could be smb mid market and enterprise mm-hmm. and given that particular um life cycle everybody has different processes that they go through right so mm-hmm. if it's going to be smb or mid market you might have the vp of a particular division or the cxo directly jump on the call and take things forward but as and when the size of the organization grows you'll have somebody from the user group who would be evaluating this and then that gets passed on to their mm-hmm. leadership and then the management so you have like a slightly longer longer internal decision making process so that's something that you can really work on cutting short right so you kind of push them to bring the buyers and the um basically the sponsors into the conversation much earlier that's one way that you can cut cut it short per se um and 
for us at AP Flight, we range anywhere between a week and six months, right? So the average, I think if I just want to average that out, it'll be like three and a half months. But um, it's very, very dependent on the industry and the size of the organization. It need not necessarily be the ticket size, but these two other factors are primarily what define all of this, right? Mm -hmm. Because as and when the size of the company grows, you have a lot of paperwork that needs to be mm -hmm. done. So even if they've verbally agreed mm. to signing on you, um, there's going to be security, there's going to mm. be an IT review, and then there's going to be procurement who comes in. Uh, and for a very small ticket size, it could be a longer process. Mm. So that's something that you can preempt and have the team, legal, the finance, and the rest of the product marketing team uh, put together preempted questions for security, right? So all of your certification, mm. all of that is something that you can definitely try fast tracking and templatizing from your end if you just want to like push it a little faster. Mm -hmm. But um, those would be a couple of things that uh, we've seen to have worked and helped in the past mm -hmm. for us. Understandable. Like talking about what you said about legal, finance, procurement team, a lot of teams need to be involved in this process because first, it's a very important process, important thing uh, for a company, right? And they need a lot of internal uh, internal discussion to get into uh, to buy the product, right? So talking about that, can you walk through your process, your sales process of closing the deal? What are the processes, checklists do you see um, and help that help in closing the deals more effectively and efficiently in your sales pipeline? That's a good question. So in terms of closure, we initially start off with the agreement and we continue to do that, right? So as in when you do understand that your buyer has, um, you know, sided with you and this is the vendor that they're going to go forward with, um, you kind of preempt the dates. Some some people might come back and tell you that, hey, I want to sign two months later. Uh, can we probably revisit this conversation then? And that's going to be a big red flag because they're not going to come back. They're never going to come back. Um, so if that's something that they do tell you, you go ahead and post date your agreement at that specific date of start and then get it signed so you could then go ahead and revisit the conversation. Right. Um, what I've seen a lot of vendors do is hold back on the payment. So they start onboarding only after the payments come through. Uh, and that's something that they kind of do have to do once they've signed the agreement. So make sure that you're not holding the user group back because, you know, some other team is pulling out a little bit longer on the paperwork, right? Because as and when they start seeing value and they work with your team, they're going to go ahead and internally fast track that process as well. Mm -hmm. Try parallel your entire process um, where you would want them to get started and try exhibiting more value at the earliest as you can right? mm -hmm. because th those are various factors that go a very long way in terms of renewals in terms of retention like it's not just going to be a transactional sale you've also got to think about uh, the future of the customer and the partnership that you're going to have with them right so those will be a couple of things that um i've surprisingly not seen a lot of people do so um would be highly recommended and appreciated from a buyer's end as well hmm. true understandable so uh any tip you want to give uh people so that uh in the deal closing uh when we are talking about closing the leads right they are negotiation about pricing about various things so any tips that work for you uh, while closing the deal and making it more effective and the rate of closing also increased. What worked for you? Um, one of the first things was to not agree to a price that your buyer is quoting. Uh, do not fall for negotiation because that sometimes affects the impact that, the, that they might think about the product. So mm -hmm. uh, it's always good to ask again as to why they would like for the budget to be reduced and why they're not ready to pay that much. That again adds value right so every step you just have to constantly think about how it's going to be beneficial for the customer because at the end of the day they're going to get something out of it and you're solving a problem that they're facing right now so keep that in mind and do not make it a numbers game i do understand that you know the entire team's commissions depend on it but that shouldn't be the priority as in when you're speaking to the other person so um that would be something because that 
exudes a little bit of confidence and also very good quality on products, right? Because big brands such as you know, Nike, Louis Vuitton, everybody has established why they are priced that heavily. So um, branding goes a long way. And that's something that, you know, has actually worked for us when you push back on negotiation. Um, and the second thing in terms of increasing win rates per se, um, it's always nice for them to let you know what is the stopping factor, right? It could be a competitor's price that they have uh, given to you. It could have been budget that they're slated for the next quarter, but they're trying to bring it in. All of that is something that you can definitely go ahead and consider and accommodate on your end as well. Mm -hmm. So once you hear them, it's going to be a very different conversation rather than just, you know, hey, I want it reduced by 50% or 30% um, and then just get it signed and continue to move on. Mm -hmm. So all of those are definitely um, factors that you need to start visiting again before you deal with it as a bang on um, head on head number game, per se. Truly said that just reducing your product price for the deal of getting the deal done, right? Mm -hmm. For just to get the deal done is not the right way for negotiation as uh, the product value also decreases, right? Uh, when you say that you are decreasing the price, uh, your product value, the customer, how they see the product also decreases. In their eye, they are, you are reducing the price. It means that product is not up to the mark. But you are not that... Uh, not that uh, in the sense uh, you are not that in the product that it will work right so you are reducing the price just to get a number game right so as uh, like said by you uh, it's like don't negotiate on the basis of only the price ask them why they want to reduction it's because of the competitors because they want more features and everything and then close it right absolutely yeah so talking about that, uh, product demo plays a very important part. People want to see the demo, how it works. So what are the uh, what are the way of structuring a product demo to effectively uh, showcase the features and benefits of the product to the audience or to your potential uh, customers? That's a great question. Um, and I would say both of that would probably become priority number two. The priority number one would be what would be the value that they were going to get out of it, right? So uh, that's something that we strongly believe in and has worked for us in the past. Uh, and I hope it will continue to work as well. Where during your discovery phase, you completely understand what is the final goal of whatever they're trying to do right um for some people it's been as simple as hey i'm just gonna save so much time on it or it would be a very um emotional thing where they're gonna not feel frustrated they're not going to um you know depend on other people to do or execute a particular task these are nuances that you can definitely take up and elucidate as and when you're pitching your product right because um to scale onboarding and more there's going to be a standard demo flow that's usually given to an account executor that you have to continue to follow but make sure that the features that were of priority to them and the ones that you think would make the most difference are being talked at first right so when you are doing your discovery make those notes make it very clear and identify those features that would help answer that question. So you could briefly introduce the product and then start your entire demo flow from what is of most importance to them. Mm -hmm. right? so that would be a very good way in which you can address concerns and um, you know directly have their attention. It's very important that they're with you throughout the entire product demo because um, sometimes it runs for as long as 45 minutes in one hour. And you know that an average human's attention span is not that much. Mm -hmm. You don't want to miss, you don't want them to be missing out because you are used to doing it. You can go ahead and pitch to anybody for like an hour and a half as well. But how much of it have they taken away is going to be your end goal. Mm -hmm. right? So make sure you start your conversation and end your conversation with what you want them to remember from that entire demo at the end of the day. Right. But again, from a demo perspective, uh, perspective make sure you've got a very clean instance that will um, showcase all of the features that you want them to see in a very seamless fashion right don't make, make sure that there are no glitches there are no um, lags or the experience is basically extremely impactful for them so 
go an extra mile, make it as custom as possible. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of people right now even bring in uh, the brand details into every demo that they're doing. So all of that definitely works, right? Because um, for you, it's one product and it's going to work the same for everybody. But for them, they want to see how it will look for them when they start using it. So when you approach it as a conversation in the day of their life, it becomes a very different perspective that you would be giving them. So that's that's helped a lot. Uh, as you said, the personalization, your product mm -hmm. plays a very important part, right? And when you personalize, it's not like just a generic message you're sending to everybody. It's more personalized mm -hmm. and people are more... Uh, the, uh, you become more interested to listen to that product, what it offers, rather than uh, listening to the generic pitch that everyone says. Okay. So after the demo, how do you measure the uh, success of a product demo? It's the next stage. If uh, if the person who is going to the next stage, it's the success of the product demo. Or how do you measure that the product demo we have given is up to the mark? Great question. Um, one of the first things that hit you is how conversational the demo was, whether you had them engaged or not. So that also determines the success of your product demo. And the next is when you decide on the next steps, right? So there could be various things as next steps. It could be another follow-on demo. It could be a meeting with a larger team mm -hmm. or it could directly be, in, be signing off. Mm -hmm. They would to the rest of the team, you, you, you go ahead, um, negotiate, you finish the entire process, and you sign, and you go ahead. But mm -hmm. to move to one of these next stages is going to be the impact that you have on your product demo, right? And as in when you're showcasing something on the product, it's very important for us to understand how impacted they are about it, right? It could be good or bad. If you don't know what you've left as an after effect with them, then that's going to be a very difficult part to navigate to take the deal forward, right? So it's very important to to know what uh, they have felt about the product before you close that meeting up. Um, so I think so. The entire aspect of all of this is to make sure that you do not you know, see directly as it is, but you try reading through the lines. And that's essentially mm -hmm. the entire difference that we're trying to make as well. Right. So we need to go beyond uh, very stereotypical metrics and continue to remember that this has to add value uh, to the people that you're talking to, for which we also need to know what will add, add value to them. Mm -hmm. So these are a couple of things that come to the top of my head. True, true, true. Hundred percent agree that what you have said. Talking about that, as you move from one background to other, right? From technical to it was the sales background. So people who are uh, like you, who wants to change their background or who wants to, from a fresher, wants to go into the B two B marketplace, right? Uh, so what advice you want to give? Three advice they, that you want to give them so that it become a little bit easier process as you have experienced it's on your own, right? So it is completely different. Like you're coding in. Uh, in a cabin now you're talking to different people with different level of persuasion so how do you do that give us the three advices i'm not sure if i can think of three but i'm gonna like go that with you know. um i think the first and most important thing is you need to ask yourself if you're ready for it because um I know I happen to get into sales by choice, but I really wish I'd made a conscious decision earlier in my career, right? And it's not uh, easy. It's not something that is um, very openly available. And it's also a very interesting role because you are the face the company and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that right so you need to just ask yourself talk to a lot of people who've been in that industry been there done that before before you make that um or take that call per se right uh so that's definitely one of the first pieces of advice i've given anybody else who has asked me as well uh and the second is just because you can talk a lot it does not mean you're gonna be a good salesperson you need to be an extremely good listener so uh do not get blindsided by a lot of commercials and more that you've seen um or the wrong takeaway that you might have had 
said, because the best salespeople I've also met out there are fantastic listeners. They talk at least just half of what the other person um, talks to them. So that's another thing. So make sure that you're ready to sign on to that as such. Um, and the third thing is don't do it for the money. Mm -hmm. It's very tempting, but that should not be your driving goal. If you're going to wake up every day and uh, go to go um, you know, sell the entire product, do it because maybe you know you're solving the problem for the other person and money's like you know a consequence of it but yeah. not the main goal right? because the moment you have that in front of you you're going to start becoming very pushy and it's going to become a very uh, annoying conversation for the other person per se. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right so uh don't let that drive you 100 percent agree with you words <laughs> <laughs> so talking uh, about that uh i'll say this person need to meet the target Every every job has started, right? Uh, be it's operation, be it's uh, various, but uh, we focus more on sales. That's a revenue-driven product, right? You get the revenue, then you can get <laughs> to the team, right? So uh, getting your target then, uh, so how do you make sure that it it's a process, by product of your doing the hard work, right? That getting your uh, achievements, getting your target done. And sometimes it happens that you give your 100 percent, right? And it's a very demotivating factor. So how do you deal with it all? Like in being new to this and how do you deal with Very nice question. Um, so what a lot of people kind of miss out and get emotionally driven, I was definitely one of them, right? Um, was the fact that if one or two really big deals that you were working on didn't get through, you kind of go back and really retrospect as to what went so badly wrong. Uh, but don't let those affect you. I know target meeting is essentially what the core description of your job is, but it happens. There are a few factors that are really not in your control. And um, it is not possible for everybody to meet target every month or every quarter, mm -hmm. right? And it's okay. It's very important to accept that it's okay. But if you think it's a pattern and it's consistently happening, you can address it. But don't let it affect you personally. Mm -hmm. And having said that, uh, meeting targets is very simple math, right? You know your win ratio you know the kind of pipeline that you would need to close something like this and you know what your strengths are if you've been in sales for like a year or two you'll definitely understand what the pattern of your conversion looks like mm -hmm. right so try targeting similar opportunities so you have a hang of it and you always have that safety net that you've created that you can fall back on if the other uh, ambitious deals that you have don't come through yeah. right so you always um, compensate with that but this is essentially what needs to be a number game right mm -hmm. you need to work on the math so you make sure that you have enough at least right you're putting in all of the effort in the right direction to forecast that particular commit that you're going to be giving uh, the rest of the team. But apart from that, a sales rut is a real thing and it happens to the best of salespeople. That four months or five months, you know, if, even if it lasts that long, should not deter you from the entire uh, objective of the larger mission that you've actually set out to achieve. So and I've seen a lot of people uh, choose to, you know, switch jobs at that point in time or switch teams internally. They're going to, you know, go entirely in a different direction and try new things out. You can definitely do it, but that shouldn't be the reason that should have motivated you to take that step, right? So um, again, just simple math and make sure the blame's not yours. You continue to work, right? You continue to put in the same effort and not withdraw. But um, at the case you need external help, do not hesitate to ask because uh, there are going to be like multiple people willing to pull you out of that rut um, at that point in time. So 100% agree with your words about pulling yourself from that situation, not affecting your mental health or your like, other life that is other than the work life it's a personal life don't uh, let it affect that 
Talk to you about that. One last question, Ashley, for you. As a typical day, work day in your life. So how do you make sure what plans you make, what checklists you make before you start your day, what your KPIs are, and how do you make sure that it's a very successful, what your definition of a good day looks like? <laughs> I really wish I had all of that already because an mm -hmm. ideal day can I, I can go on and talk about it, but it's very difficult to make sure it is an ideal day, right? Um, so typically, so what um my role at the organization is global sales. Uh, so I don't really have fixed timings. I do cater to uh, meeting requests that come in at any given point in the day, right? So given that schedule, um, I do try to block certain times during the day because I can't set timelines because I could have an overlapping meeting at that point in time. So activities that I prioritize would be preparation for the um, meetings that I have for that day. If there needs to be any prerequisite that I need to be solving or follow-ups that I need to take care of, all of the um, preparation predominantly is like of highest priority to me right mm -hmm. and the second highest priority would be email follow-ups or phone calls everything uh, to make sure that i can keep moving the rest of the deals in my pipeline forward um, and the third which is scheduled already for me are going to be the meetings and demos by themselves mm -hmm. i have all of that on my calendar around which i kind of structure the rest of my day and mm -hmm. the last aspect of it would be time on LinkedIn or any other avenue for prospecting, a little bit on communities as well. Uh, so I do slate that out, even if it's you know during lunch and I'm just like scrolling through my phone while eating, though highly not recommended. If the day is like a little hectic, I do end up doing that as well. Um, apart from that, I think it's very important to continue to maintain your own personal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. so, um, I try getting in a workout in the morning and before bed, whenever I sleep, um, I try reading for at least like 20, 25 minutes before I like hit bed. Um, and I've started to become a little conscious about lesser phone screen time because I already have a lot on my laptop. So um, I don't basically use my phone the first 30 minutes after I wake up and 30 minutes before I go to bed. It was also why I take out my book. So I know I've done the 30 minutes before mm -hmm. I hit bed. Uh, so these have been a couple of things that have helped in the past because you do get a little carried away and um, you kind of you know compromise on lifestyle. So I learned it the hard way. So I, I hope people prioritize it before they have to learn it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> Truly agree with your words. Like maintaining a work-life balance is very important and giving due importance to your work as well as, as your personal life is yes. <laughs> into success for lifestyle and work life. Thank you Ashley for your important lesson and it was so interesting talking to you, knowing about the bits and the way you explain it's totally amazing. Like <laughs> I don't know how uh, like when you were giving a product demo, like people was really, really, <laughs> really truly the way you explain each and every point giving the information you are like uh, very, uh, very good in your like convincing skill and i can see i can see <laughs> one person thank you on team you really appreciate your time and efforts i know being in sales is a very tough and time consuming but giving back to community uh Vashni, it's very important as well and thank you for this and team you just really really thankful looking forward for more uh this uh, sessions and it was lovely talking to you same here, Amrita. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for choosing to speak with me as well. And you've been very kind with your words. I really appreciate it. And look forward to staying in touch with you. And yeah. good luck to you and the rest of the team yeah. with this initiative and many, many more things to come. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>